This is a story about a ruthless killer who caused panic throughout Britain, carrying out dozens of violent robberies on sub-post offices. When challenged, he killed without mercy. A man so elusive and deadly, he was nicknamed the Black Panther. Only one crime overshadowed the Panthers' terror campaign, the kidnap of a teenage heiress named Leslie Whittle. One man made it his mission to return Leslie to her family alive. Detective Bob Booth. This is the story of his investigation, how it was riddled with blunders, and how it became one of the most controversial in British criminal history. The story of Leslie Whittle's kidnap began on January the 14th, 1975, in the mining village of Hiley, Shropshire. Here, 17-year-old Leslie shared a large, detached home with her mother. Detective Bob Booth was quickly on the scene. He'd just been awarded the MBE for solving every one of the 70 murders he'd investigated. His first job was to find out all he could about the missing teenager. The picture I built of Leslie was that she was a friendly, homely sort of girl. Pleasant. Nice to be with. She was a girl loved by her mother. Loved terribly deeply by her mother. And that showed because I have never seen a mother so distraught in my life. It was clear that Leslie had been snatched from her bed in the middle of the night. She'd taken none of her clothes except a dressing gown. But why would anyone kidnap a quiet teenager from a remote village? Booth discovered that Leslie's family owned a large coach firm in the area and she was due to inherit part of the family fortune. The Whittle's transport manager, Len Rudd, had known Leslie since she was a child. Leslie was great. She was fun-loving, no airs and graces. She was just a down-to-earth girl and, you know, just a joy to be around. She was a lovely, beautiful girl. I would have been proud if she'd have been my daughter. That's how much I thought of Leslie. Booth knew if he was to bring Leslie back home alive, he had to follow the kidnapper's instructions left on dymo tape on a chocolate box in the family lounge. It gave you instructions to be at a telephone kiosk in Kidderminster between six o'clock that night and one o'clock in the morning to answer the call only and give your name and take the £50,000 ransom money and that most emphatically no police and no tricks, otherwise death. Booth collected £50,000 from the Whittles bank. Every note was then photocopied so it could be traced later. Leslie's brother Ronald was the courier. Because of the death threat, he arrived at the rendezvous alone but hidden nearby, undercover policemen were watching every move. Inspector Eddie Barry was in a building just 50 yards away, waiting to play his secret role in the operation. I had to go down to 
the telephone exchange in Kidderminster Town Centre to monitor certain calls to two telephone kiosks which were in the Swan Centre. And uh, if there was any calls to these particular two kiosks, I was to record them on a tape recorder machine. Everything was in place. Now they could only wait for the kidnapper to call. But then came a problem. Booth had so far managed to keep the kidnap secret from the press, but he'd failed to request a news blackout. Now journalists had found out about the story, and at the worst possible time, they broke it. News is coming in of a kidnapping in the Shropshire village of Hyley. It's understood a young girl has been abducted and police have found a ransom demand. It's believed £50,000 is being asked for the safe return of Leslie Whittle, the daughter of a wealthy coach firm proprietor. We'll bring you more details as we get them. I just froze. I thought, well, now, the world knows that Leslie Whittle has been kidnapped. And I hope it does not spell the death knell for Leslie. Booth could only hope the kidnapper hadn't heard the news and would continue with his plan. He was lucky. Six hours into the vigil, the kidnapper made his move. About 12 midnight, uh, a call came through to one of the kiosks, and it rang, and it rang, uh, and I switched on the tape recorder. Um, nothing happened, and, uh, and it just went off. And I spoke to Bob and uh, told him what had happened, uh, that no one had answered the telephone, and I expected somebody to be in there, and he was not pleased. It was the second blunder of the night. The officer Booth had left in charge at the telephone kiosks had called off the vigil because of the news leak. When the kidnapper's call came, there was no one to answer it. I, I just felt gutted. I just felt sick that... Uh... That should have happened, because it should not. We let her down. I let her down. I'm in charge. It was my fault. Leslie Whittle had been missing for 24 hours, and no one knew where she was, how she was being treated, or whether the police blunders would cost her her life. As the second day of Leslie Whittle's kidnap ordeal began, the world's press descended on Hiley. The story was splashed on every front page in the country. There was this tiny little village besieged by all these journalists and photographers. But it was hard to really get to grips with the fact that somebody could be kidnapped from a small English village. You know, a little girl of, what, 17 who, you know, nobody had ever heard of. Um, and all of a sudden she's been kidnapped, there are ransoms, it's all stuff of movies. The reporters were desperate to interview Leslie's family, but Bob Booth was determined to protect them. I, I thought Ronald Whittle was uh, very composed throughout, and I thought his resilience to this traumatic event was dealt with with tremendous courage and no outward emotion, inward emotion, I'm sure. His heart must have been you know, torn out. His mother showed it. His mother was a mother in distress. Booth decided to return to the rendezvous for a second night, but the press had now discovered where it was. And as Ronald Whittle waited for the kidnapper's vital call, he was hounded by photographers. I just can't imagine anything more bizarre in such a serious crime. A girl has been taken from her home, and here the press are, wanting photographs and quizzing me about where the scene of the action's going to be. I'm not against investigative journalism, but there is a limit.
and the limit has to be drawn when a person's life is at stake. Whittle waited at the telephone kiosk for several hours, but this time the kidnapper didn't call. Fears for Leslie's safety began to grow. What on earth am I thinking is the predicament of Leslie Whittle? Where is she? Hell, I thought. The poor girl. I, I don't know how she's being treated. I don't know how she's being held. I'm fearful of her safety. I thought, if this is getting emotionally involved, I've bought it hook, line and sinker. After two days, Leslie Whittle was no nearer being returned safely to her family. Twenty-four hours later, a dramatic development. A midnight phone call to the Whittles' home, answered by Len Rudd. This is Leslie's voice. Mom, you to go to Kids School Post Office telephone box. The instructions are inside. I was elated, I thought. You know, yes, we've got Leslie back. I'm OK, but there will be no sleep and no tricks, OK? Len's elation soon disappeared when he realised it was only a recording of Leslie's voice. When I found it was a tape, it just went sunk to my shoes. I was just really gutted that night. For police, though, it was the breakthrough they'd been waiting for. Leslie's tape message had given instructions to take the ransom money to a phone box in Kidsgrove, 75 miles away. A Scotland Yard surveillance team joined the hunt. To make it look like Ronald Whittle was acting alone, they fitted him with a radio transmitter, linking him to undercover policemen. Meanwhile, Booth alerted Staffordshire police that a sensitive ransom run was taking place on their patch. I jokingly said, tell them to stay in bed, because I didn't want any police intrusion, if you like, from Staffordshire to be involved in this very, very delicate and sensitive operation. But all the careful preparations had taken time, and when Ronald Whittle finally got to Kidsgrove, he was more than an hour late. Then he spent another 30 minutes searching frantically for the message, which had been hidden behind the backboard. Now he followed the kidnapper's directions to a new rendezvous a mile away, where he was to wait for a flashing light. But there was to be no ransom drop. The kidnapper failed to appear. And after waiting for an hour, the puzzled detectives reluctantly called off the operation. At daybreak, police got a better view of the scene of the aborted ransom drop. It was at Bathpool Park, a local beauty spot. Booth says he wanted to mount a full-scale search, but the Scotland Yard team disagreed. The kidnapper had told Ronald Whittle not to involve the police, and any major search would make it obvious that he had. Scotland Yard said that would put Leslie's life in danger, so they promised their own officers would search the scene, but discreetly. The yard went back that day, and the yard went back the next day. And the view was, it was clearly expressed to me, 
that there was nothing there of significance. Booth kept the latest ransom run secret from the press, but he was desperate to keep in touch with the kidnapper. So he persuaded the family to make a direct appeal through the media. I am on the phone at home. I'm there day and night. I'm just hoping that they will get in touch with me. But I will make one other point. We have had a number of hoax calls and these people, frankly, are wasting their time because we shall not act, I shall not move from the house until I have definite proof that Leslie is alive and well. If this silence of the kidnappers continues, will you start to fear the worst? I suppose I must. I don't know. You know, I never get around to thinking that way. If we could just know something, if somebody would just contact us anyhow, we don't care how. The media appeal failed to persuade the kidnapper to make contact. But after a week of silence, there was a new development, one that would transform the whole investigation. West Midlands police asked Bob Booth to examine a car which had been abandoned in Dudley on the second night of the kidnap. As Ronald Whittle had waited for the kidnapper to call, a gunman had opened fire on security guard Gerald Smith outside the Freightliner's railway depot, just 300 yards from where the car had been found. But in a third major blunder of the investigation, the police had failed to notice the car for eight days. When they did, they found several suspicious items which they thought might be linked to the disappearance of Leslie Whittle. When Bob Booth arrived at the scene, police gave him a cassette they'd found inside the car. I hope and I pray that that cassette is going to play music. I just pray for music. I want anything. But what I don't want is to hear Leslie Whittle. If Leslie Whittle speaks on that tape, I thought, we're doomed. Had the West Midlands police missed a priceless clue for more than a week, Booth was about to find out. My prayers for music just were shattered at hearing Leslie's voice. And from that moment on, I feared not only for her safety, but her well-being, because I'd lost eight days in the investigation in the vehicle that was used to kidnap her not being found. There were even more clues inside the car Four envelopes that gave details of a ransom run involving phone boxes all over the Midlands. Booth followed the trail. It was the route Ronald Whittle would have taken if he hadn't missed the crucial call on the first night of the kidnap. It led to two kiosks in Dudley just yards from where the kidnapper's car had been abandoned. Here, a message directed Ronald Whittle to drive across the bridge to the Freightliner's railway depot. And on a lamppost, police found another crucial piece of Dymo tape. It said, Crossroad, 
onto car park to gate 8 of Dudley Zoo. That's straight in line with where the shooting took place of Gerald Smith. It was clear that the kidnapper had been laying the ransom trail to a drop point at Dudley Zoo when he'd been disturbed by the security guard. That was why he'd failed to ring Ronald Whittle at the kiosks on the second night of the kidnap. Booth was now convinced that the man who'd kidnapped Leslie Whittle had also shot Gerald Smith in cold blood. I was dealing with a most ruthless, merciless killer. And there is no doubt in my mind at all that at the drop of a hat, he would kill again. There was even more chilling news to come. Police found that the bullets fired at Gerald Smith were identical to those used in murders by Britain's most wanted man. Leslie Whittle was in the hands of the Black Panther. The Black Panther first hit the headlines a year earlier, when sub-postmaster Donald Skepper was murdered by a hooded gunman in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. My impression of this man is a man who is quite cold, utterly ruthless if he meets the slightest opposition at all. And man has no compunction about taking human life. Any member of the public who has any thoughts at all about having a go with this man, my advice to him is don't. I repeat, don't. Police quickly linked him to dozens of unsolved robberies in which the intruder had used a brazen bit to force open windows, had cut telephone wires and had worn a black hood. Five months later, he killed Derek Aston during another late night confrontation in Lancashire. Now policemen all over Britain were hunting him. This man is obviously a thinker. He's cold, and I think one can say that he's obviously ruthless. And the worry is, of course, that he may do it again. Within two months, he had. Postmaster Sidney Grayland was shot dead, and his wife Peggy battered senseless with a pistol. The Black Panther had killed three times in nine months, and left Gerald Smith fighting for his life. Now the same merciless killer would decide the fate of Leslie Whittle. The news that Leslie Whittle was in the hands of the Black Panther made headlines around the world. It was just the biggest, biggest news story that anybody had covered. I mean, it was like big enough that a local heiress had been kidnapped. But then to just get shortly down the line and find that a man that the police were hunting called the Black Panther could be the same guy. It seemed beyond belief. It, it was everywhere. But still, the kidnapper remained silent, and as the trail began to grow cold, Bob Booth again wanted to mount a detailed search of Bathpool Park, scene of the failed ransom run on the third day of the kidnap. But how could he do it without proving to the kidnapper that Ronald Whittle had involved the police? This man can't beat the the resources that are deployed against him? Never. He decided to gamble on an elaborate hoax. In a documentary about the kidnapping, Ronald Whittle would let it slip that he'd taken part in a secret ransom run. This is the first time I've mentioned this in actual fact, but uh, I went out on the call. Um, it was to Kids Grove in actual fact. In the same program, Booth then pretended to know nothing of Whittle's contact with the kidnapper. Are you going to have to go for this man if he contacts Ronnie Whittle again? Pardon? Are again? you going to... Yes. What do you mean, again? Whittle says he's already made a contact. 
I would have thought you might have known about this. But I don't know about it until you've just raised it, no. Well, when did you get to know about well, it? Well, we spoke to Whittle yesterday, and he mentioned it. He said it was the first time he'd mentioned it to the press, and I wasn't quite clear whether he'd mentioned it to you. Are you telling me now that Ron Whittle has been out somewhere dealing with a man he believes to be the kidnapper. Well, uh, Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not telling you. I'm, I'm simply saying that that's what Ronnie Whittle told me. Well, then, I'm afraid this has got to terminate. I was fully aware it was an awful deception to have to carry on, but it was so. It's, it was an operational means of, 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 of getting through to the kidnapper. Booth believed that the kidnapper would understand that he now had a legitimate reason to search Bathpool Park. And, as he'd suspected, it did contain vital clues. A piece of dymo tape discarded by a land drain, which read, Drop suitcase into hole. A spanner used to unlock the metal bars on the drain. And a torch on which the dymo tape message had been fixed. All had been missed in Scotland Yard's search of the park seven weeks earlier. It was yet another police blunder. I just couldn't believe it, because my trust had gone into the yard telling me that there was nothing there of significance. And here I am now confronted with evidence in my wildest dreams I never thought to hear about. You didn't have to search for it. You just had to walk there into the park Scenes of crime officer Philip Maskery was called in to follow the trail of clues into the underground shafts which ran beneath the park. My specific brief was to come to this land drain, which was the drop-off point for the ransom, and to pick up on what was our best evidence at that time. I was lowered on a rope down to the bottom of this shaft, and it's at the bottom of the shaft that we, we really found our first two items which were going to be of any interest to us. One was a diamond tape gun and the other was some elastoplast. At the bottom of the drain, Maskery found a network of tunnels. If this was the kidnapper's base, he had a choice of escape routes. Back on the surface, Maskery inspected a raised area of the park, where a pair of binoculars and a leather jacket had just been found. Here was another shaft, which had to be searched. My thoughts on, on the day were that I was possibly following where the kidnapper of Leslie Riddle had been. I was finding certain things, such as a reporter's notebook, a tape recorder, batteries, pencils, that sort of thing. Most inhospitable place, cold, damp, unusual noises, fear of rats, vermin, all sorts of things. Maskery followed the trail of clues to the bottom of the 60-foot shaft. Right down at the bottom, on the bottom platform, there was a piece of foam. I could see a metal hawser going across the foam. And also there was a sleeping bag in a plastic bag. The metal hawser was secured to one of these metal ladders right down at the bottom. And the other, the other end of the, the hawser went underneath the bottom platform. When I got down and leaned over, and actually got my head underneath the bottom platform. It was virtually face to face with Leslie Whittle. She was tethered like a dog, hanging from a metal hawser or by the neck with no clothes on. And to imagine a 17 year old girl having to endure that and finally to succumb to it and, and die here, beggars belief.
victim, Leslie Whittle, has been found in a shaft at Bathpool Park, Staffordshire, after a seven-week search. The 17-year-old heiress had not been seen since she was abducted from a home in Highley, Shropshire, on January the 14th. How evil, how ruthless, how terribly wicked this man is that we've hunted for seven weeks. God above, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams he'd do such a thing to a girl. It's, it, it's, it's terrible. All the evidence suggested that the Black Panther had killed Leslie on the night of the failed ransom run to Bathpool Park. But if so, why had he murdered her instead of collecting the ransom money and making his getaway? One possible explanation was about to emerge. Nightclub DJ Peter Shorto had been in the park with his girlfriend at exactly the time Ronald Whittle was due to hand over the £50,000. Yes, I left work uh, about half past two in the morning. Arrived here about um, quarter to three uh, with my girlfriend. Um, I was here for about 15 minutes. Um, I saw a torch in front of me about 150 yards, um, either flashing on and off or uh, waving from side to side. I just assumed it was somebody out for a late night uh, walk, or walking his, his dog, perhaps, you know, I thought nothing about it at all. It seemed that the panther had mistaken Shorto for Ronald Whittle, and was signalling him to bring the ransom money. But his evidence contained an even more controversial claim. But at the same time, a police panda car um, drove in, I stopped just to my right, about a hundred yards away. He stopped for a cigarette. If Shorter was right, a police car had stumbled into the ransom operation as the Panther was planning to collect the money. Booth believed this was a potentially fatal blunder. Immediately, I recognized that what had happened was that the kidnapper had panicked because of that police car. I had no doubts whatsoever in my mind that that's what had compromised the operation. He murdered her because of that police panda car causing him to panic and he vented his anger on her by pushing her to her death down that shaft, that hell hole of a place of confinement. Booth's interpretation is disputed by Harold Wright, the head of Staffordshire CID at the time. He believes Shorto was mistaken. We've got to accept they were a courting couple in Bathpool that night. We've got to accept they saw a police vehicle or something that to them resembled a police vehicle. They did not see a Staffordshire police vehicle because there was no Staffordshire officer or vehicle near Bathpool that night. There's no doubt at all it was, um, it was a panda car. Definitely. You couldn't have mistaken it for any other car? No, it was a panda car. The war of words over the panda car caused a bitter rift between senior police officers. But the only man who knew the truth was the Black Panther himself, and he was still at large. As panic began to sweep the country, Staffordshire police announced they were calling in Scotland Yard to lead the murder hunt. Bob Booth was to be sidelined. Commander John Morrison, head of the Yard's International Murder Squad, was to lead the investigation, with Inspector Wally Borham in charge of the incident room. Most um, murder inquiries, when you arrive at the scene, you've got a dearth of clues, and uh, by investigation, you build up those clues systematically. In this case, it was almost uh, unique. We were inundated with clues. There was a mattress. Uh, there were Zeiss binoculars that were found in the park. There was a tape found in the park. There's Dymo tape found in the park. There's a tape recorder found down the shaft. And it just went on and on and on. So we were absolutely inundated. We had an embarrassment of riches for clues. Detectives began work tracing where the abandoned items had been bought, confident that the paper trail would lead them to the kidnapper. 
To keep the pressure on, they released the kidnapper's handwriting in case anyone recognized it and demonstrated the kind of wire used as a noose for Leslie. The biggest clue of all was a fingerprint found on a notepad left in the death shaft. But when no match was found in millions of police files, even this failed to unmask the Black Panther. We knew everything about the man we wanted. We got his height, his age, his clothing, everything about him. We knew everything about him except his name and address. For several months, Britain's biggest ever manhunt dragged on, with no sign of a breakthrough. Then, almost a year after Leslie Whittle's kidnap, there was a sensational new development. Two policemen had just started panda car duty in Mansfield when they went to question a man acting suspiciously near a post office. Whilst my colleague was asking the questions, I was writing the answers down. And as I got to the more or less the last question, suddenly a voice says, don't move, any tricks and you're dead. At this point I glanced to my left and was looking down the business end of a double barrel sawn off shotgun. And my exact words at that time was, fucking hell. And that's all I said. And the next thing I felt was this gun pushed into my ribs underneath my armpit. And on getting himself comfortable, he says, right, drive. Well, I, I thought that we'd got this local nutter to be quite precise with you. I was thinking, now we've got to do something here uh, to get help or disarming or something. As we're going down the hill, the road goes into a Y-shaped junction. I'm thinking, whichever way we go, we're going into open country. And if we get into open country, there's no way that we are going to survive this, I believe. He was, was going to kill us. And I swung the car across the road to the right, over the white line, and then swung it back to the left. Braked hard. The car came to a halt outside a chip shop, where Roy Morris was ordering his supper. When he saw two police officers fighting a gunman, he came running to help. I said to him, well, what do you want me to do? What's going off, you know? And he says, grab his wrist. Because we got him on the floor, we yeah. were struggling yeah. like mad yeah. to, get, to get hold of him, yeah, because we were right. overpowering him. Yeah. I was looking in his eyes, and he, he, his eyes didn't look at me. They were partially closed and sort of... Shaking as if you like, as if you do, as if you were mad because you couldn't do nothing. And I said to you, get his wrist together so yes. we can get the handcuffs yes. on. So I grabbed his wrist and they, they, I held him there till they got the cuffs on. They were all over in a minute, yeah. wasn't it? I mean, it, it sent to lifetime really, yeah. but by yeah. the time yeah. it was all over, it was it, over in seconds. The time we picked him up from here and going to them railings and cuffed him again and then searching him. That were a longer spell of time than what happened here. At the end of the day, we ended up protecting him. Well, there were quite him. a crowd gathered, yeah. Yeah. So I, I can remember one bloke took a, threw a blow at him. Battered and bruised, the gunman was taken away for questioning. For two days, he remained silent. Then he reluctantly gave his name. He was Donald Nielsen, a self-employed joiner from Bradford. A former soldier. Nielsen had seen action in Cyprus and Aden and had learned jungle warfare in Kenya. He was married and had a daughter almost exactly the same age as Leslie Whittle. Police began a detailed search of his home and in a locked attic 
they found an extraordinary collection of equipment. Tools, maps, car keys, and black hoods. They found weapons, including a sawn-off shotgun and ammunition. And in the back of a drawer, they found this model of a Black Panther. If Donald Nielsen was Britain's most wanted man, it seemed he had secretly enjoyed the notoriety. Suspected of being the notorious Black Panther, Donald Nielsen was taken to Staffordshire to be questioned about the kidnap of Leslie Whittle and numerous other violent crimes. He began a series of bizarre interviews. He would be asked a question, a simplest of questions, um, and he would look at the wall and merely count the bricks in the wall for maybe 20, 25 minutes. We, uh, and, and he, just as you thought that he was not going to answer this question, he'd blurt out an answer. And not necessarily to the question you'd asked, but certainly he made some sort of comment. And then you'd follow that up with another question, and the same thing would happen. And slowly but surely, um, as we put more and more points to him, uh, showing him uh, the evidence that, that we had, he changed tack. And he wanted to tell us all about all of the murders. And suddenly he said, in fact, what I'll do to help you, I'll make a separate statement for each murder. There was a heavy police guard to hold back the crowds outside the court. Some of them had been waiting for five to six hours. At the time the accused arrived in a convoy of cars hidden under a blanket, there were about 200 onlookers booing and jeering. Nielsen was charged with 13 violent crimes, including four murders. When he appeared in court, the journalists who had pursued him for a year were desperate to get their first glimpse of him. The picture I had in my mind was a kind of territorial army type, you know, tall, muscular, fitness fanatic. Um, and there was this really awful little man who was about five foot six and just really ordinary looking. You would have passed him in the street a million times and never stopped and thought, I wonder if that's the Black Panther. But the truth behind Leslie Whittle's death still proved elusive. Nielsen admitted he'd suspected a police trap, but claimed it was the sound of helicopters and dogs which had panicked him, and not a police car. As he'd rushed to the shaft to gather his belongings, he'd accidentally knocked Leslie off the platform to her death. There was certainly no evidence of a helicopter, no evidence of dogs. One can only think that he thought that he'd heard dogs, he thought that he'd heard a helicopter, he thought a trap was closing in on him, and he panicked. For maybe not the first time in his criminal escapades, he panicked. And a young lady um, paid for it with her life because things didn't go right that night, somebody had to pay. Well, there was only one person that could pay, and that was Leslie Whittle, in his eyes. Booth wasn't convinced. He still believed that a panda car had caused Leslie's death. And after Nielsen had finished his confessions, Booth finally confronted the man he'd hunted for a year. My first impression was the, the lasting one. He was coiled up to react in a second, and that sums Nielsen up. Booth secretly tape-recorded his interviews with Nielsen. None have ever been heard in public until now. Well, I know for a fact that I'm right. 
drunk or quite run. Tell you what, quite what you say there, I don't blame you. Blame me, huh? Didn't know the public. I'm talking about the life of death. Yes, didn't know the public. Didn't know the public. Didn't know the public. Didn't know the public. Booth interpreted this to mean that Nielsen blamed him for sending the panda car into Bathpool Park, causing Leslie's death. And later, at Nielsen's trial, he went public with this version of events. He also revealed two more of the investigation's best-kept secrets that Scotland Yard had been involved in the ransom run and that they'd carried out the disastrous search of Bathpool Park. For five weeks, the trial of Donald Nielsen gripped the public, but it took the jury just 90 minutes to reach their verdict. There was a loud gasp from the packed public gallery, then a brief outburst of applause as the foreman of the jury announced their verdict, guilty of murder. Nielsen was given five life sentences. The judge told him, if you are ever released from prison, it should only be on account of great age or infirmity. He has now spent 26 years in prison and is unlikely to be released. As senior police officers basked in the media limelight, Bob Booth was absent. Accused of disloyalty to fellow police officers, he was thrown out of the CID and transferred to uniform. For the man who'd solved 70 murders, a glittering career was over. This is a place of great sadness, not only for me, not only for the Whittles, but I think for the community. I think it's tragic when a young life is taken, taken from her own home, ruthlessly murdered by an evil man. I don't think you can get anything worse. The memories are haunting for the family must be. They're tragic memories I've tried to erase from my own mind. The fact that they were in a way let down was of deep sorrow to me. And uh, that's how I felt at the funeral. And that's how I feel today. We let her down. I let her down. I'm in charge. It was my fault. And I'm tragically sorry.